There we go. All right. Okay. All right. Can you hear me all right? Uh, well, good evening. Thanks, everyone, for having me here. I'm um, somewhat chastened that this is the first time I've been to a shy hack night. I have been in Chicago for um, most of the last 15 years, so uh, I'm impressed with uh, the turnout here tonight and um, everything that's going on. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Paul Smith. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Ad Hoc. We are a small software company. Uh, we're about two years old, a little more than two years old. And uh, we just, uh, we're about 28 people uh, as of this week. Um, and uh, there was a great article by Stephen Levy last week. How many people read that about the USDS? Anybody? You should check it out. It's on Stephen Levy's um, uh, medium site called back channel it's a great article it's just about what the USDS has done in the last uh, little bit how many people here know what the US digital service is you've heard of it okay about 60 percent and and how many people here know what the USDS does what its mission is okay a little less I'll talk a little bit about that uh, at any rate um, there's a great moment in the article where uh, so essentially, USDS is trying to reform government from the inside of when it comes to building technology, building software. And uh, they, they actually had a hearing on the Hill uh, not too long ago. And there were lobbyists from the incumbent technology companies there. And um, there's this quote in the, in the article that said, the lobbyists represented the interests of the traditional IT contractors seem to believe it is their right to overcharge ta taxpayers for complex computer systems that don't work. And when I, <laughs> yay, uh, when I heard that, I immediately thought that's a great, perfect, concise, sweet summary for what we do at Ad Hoc, except the complete opposite of every one of those words. So if I had to say what Ad Hoc is, is we believe it is our duty to charge taxpayers a fair amount for simple computer systems that work well. Um, and, and, and that's what we're trying to do. That's really our riff. That's why we exist. Uh, we really feel it in our bones that the status quo is unacceptable and things like health care should never happen again. Um, and the US, uh, what I'm talking about in terms of re reform, there's uh, intergovernmental agencies like USDS that are working to change things from the inside the way government agencies create contracts, the way they procure, the way they think about uh, making technology solutions for problems, policy problems that they have. And then there are private sector companies, contractors, vendors, service providers, uh, who th there, there's a new generation of these companies that are have this mindset of delivering things that actually work and coming from a place of experience, having built technology in the private sector or in startups or outside of government where the standards are a little different, methodologies are different. Um, and uh, I like to say that, you know, companies like Ad Hoc are the third leg of the, the other leg of the stool, but I guess stools have three legs, so um, also people. People, the other leg is people uh, <laughs> who demand better services, who expect more from what their government can provide. And uh, who are the people we are ultimately all serving. And so yes, there was uh, a big bang event, healthcare.gov, that sent off uh, energetic particles in the wake of that. Um, and some of those uh, went in one direction, some went in another, but the common, the, 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 the failed launch of healthcare.gov in 2013 was uh, a common ancestry point in time for all of these efforts. Uh, there had been smart people working inside the government who could anticipate that this was a problem, that they saw this coming down the road, that, that uh, the way we did things needed to be reformed, but the high profile status of healthcare of failure really accelerated all of those efforts and brought them to the fore. Um, and so some of the people that were involved in the rescue, uh, some of them went inside government and they started these new agencies, the United States Digital Service, uh, USDS, 18F, which is a uh, software, sh uh, like startup sh uh, digital agency shop inside the General Services uh, Administration. Um, some of them stayed outside government, created new generation of contractors, ad hoc being one company, 
There's also Nava, Trust, uh, Nuna, uh, companies that are working in this space but uh, had either worked on the healthcare gov rescue or had uh, worked with people who had been on the rescue and had been in, in the private sector startups. Um, and the rest of the sane ones went, went, went home and got, got on with their lives. Um, so I, I've been working uh, in, you know, I like to say that I was minding my own business when I got the call in 2013 to come help figure out what was going on with healthcare gov and maybe stick around and fix it. Uh, but the truth is my whole career I've kind of been edging closer and closer to this space. Uh, I, I worked at the Center for Neighborhood Technology for six years. Uh, making websites, uh, actually Civic Footprint, so the, the look up your rep app that we just looked at, I made something called Civic Footprint in 2002 where you could, you could do that for Cook County only, but it showed you the full, all your political representation on a map. Um, I made freelance web apps for uh, Cranes and other uh, news companies, and then in 2007 started a company called EveryBlock, uh, where I made uh, custom maps and um, helped ingest local news uh, and visualize it. And then I was the deputy director of technology at the DNC um, during the 2012 campaign. I worked on the president's re-election campaign here in Chicago with Harper Reed and, and those characters. And, uh, and, and after that, some of the campaign alums that I worked with, we started a company called Public Good Software, Jason Kunish and Dan Ratner, um, and uh, which was, uh, uh, sort of premise on the idea of um, helping nonprofits uh, do better uh, with technology, uh, and then of course the rescue. Um, so what did we do? So so my co-founder Greg Gershman and I, we worked on the rescue, and that was really an operational effort. So the the, the site had already been built long ago, long before we had ever showed up on the scene, and it was really an effort in how can we. Oh my God! I thought it was dying for a second. <laughs> um, how can we, how can we, we and, and we brought our experience working on high traffic, consumer facing websites to this uh, website that was struggling to stay up. Uh, how can we show the government what it's like when you build software from scratch the right way and how effective that can be. So we started a company ad hoc uh, in 2014, spring of 2014 with five people and um, we started working with Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, that summer. So. Um, big surprise, our first client was healthcare.gov. Um, and what we did was uh, we built something called the premium estimation tool, or also known as uh, anonymous shopping. Uh, so this was for the open enrollment year 2015, so that was the fall of 2014 going into uh, winter, spring of 2015, uh, when you can get uh, new, sign up for new health insurance or change your plan. And uh, the development was uh, roughly the summer to fall of 2014 with that group of five people that uh, we initially started the company with. And uh, we served over half a billion page views uh, during that open enrollment period and it was the most visited page on healthcare.gov. Um, and it was also a demand management strategy, so it took load off of the core site. So you have to remember that healthcare.gov launched and there was this big application sort of lurking in, you know, underneath the, the uh, transactional part of the site, the part where you could actually sign up. Um, and that's still, for the most part, there today. Um, and uh, this was a tool that was designed to let people quickly get in, browse plans, see what was uh, available to them, get an idea of uh, what their subsidy might be and what kind of coverage they could get without having to go to that big heavyweight part of the site. It's better consumer experience on one hand and also took load off of that transactional part of the site. Um, from a nuts and bolts point of view, we served every page request in uh, very low latency. Um, it was very fast. We had almost virtually no downtime um, the entire time uh, we were serving. And this is what the tech stack looks like. It, there's nothing to it. It's as simple as could be by design. Um, everybody here, I'm sure, has seen a three-tier uh, web stack. There was a thin uh, JavaScript uh, front end that uh, handled some of the interaction on the site. Um, the main application server was written in Go. Uh, we had a Postgres uh, database that was where the plan data was stored. It was all deployed into Amazon Web Services. We didn't use any of their, you know, more fancy services. We just used load balancers, EC2 instances, and, and virtual private uh, compute environments, and that was it. And uh, 
I'll talk a little bit um, about simplicity uh, later on, but um, that, that was really our design uh, uh, sense. Uh, the subsequent year, that went well, so we expanded. Uh, we factored out the uh, back end part into an API service layer. This was for the subsequent open enrollment year. Um, the development was roughly from spring to fall 2015, and uh, PET evolved into window shopping. So we expanded uh, that, we added new features, and we actually had a second client application using the API, which was tax tools, a way for you to um, uh, tell the IRS information on your tax return about uh, your health insurance so that you could avoid the, uh, the individual mandate penalty. And um, I'm sorry. I think I duplicated a slide. Okay. Uh, and again, simple tech stack. The only thing that's changed here is that we've lifted the front end pieces into their own apps. Uh, we actually added a, a thin Rails application, just really a shim to handle translations and some other services, but uh, uh, everything re really remained roughly the same, um, with the API uh, being an extraction from PET. The main difference this year was, or, or this past year, with window shopping was the coverage data. So um, providers, uh, prescription drugs, and the insurance plans that cover them, uh, this is information that you know insurance companies have, obviously, but if you wanted to find that out, maybe there's a PDF on a website, uh, maybe not. Uh, so we worked with uh, uh, staff at the White House, CMS, insurance companies to come up with a schema uh, that was uh, common across all the insurance companies. They would have to provide this data in, in, in a JSON file hosted on their websites and updated at least monthly. Um, and that data set contains about 11 million doctors and facilities, about 12,000 drugs. And uh, we then developed a tool to crawl all of those websites, ingest that information, index it, make it searchable on healthcare.gov. So now, great consumer experience. You can type in the name of the doctor that you see or the drug that you take and uh, see what plans cover that, cover those things. And it's a much better consumer experience. And now that's a new public data set as well. So uh, we're, we're getting ready for open enrollment 2017. That's coming up this, this uh, November. Um, the main thing that's new is that uh, because of uh, the sort of window shopping piece of things has gone pretty well, so now we're taking over the actual core shopping experience of healthcare. So the real, when you're actually picking a plan, that will be using our software, and it'll be building on all the, the uh, technology that I just showed you. Um, and this isn't to say everything's gone swimmingly. Like the main challenges that we ex uh, encounter are mainly cultural, and I think that's to be expected. We are um, injecting into an, an the biggest, literally the biggest bureaucracy on earth, the U.S. federal government, um, a culture which is expects to be able to do things with agility, with more and different kinds of risk, with more unknowns. Uh, that really, you can just broadly think of the mindset. Uh, whether it's technology or, or some other kind of project management to be waterfall, we are going to think of everything we can possibly think of that will happen in the lifespan of this project in advance before we write any code. And then that will be in a contract. Somebody will win that contract and then do the development of everything that we anticipated up front. Um, so it's an incredibly different mindset. And it's <coughs> that process is baked into the bureaucracy at every layer of teams, of management, of developers, of policy analysts. So. Um, that's a big challenge, um, and we're just trying to model what we think is the better way of doing things, um, and hopefully bring people along who want to be change agents inside of government. And uh, our next big project is Vets.gov. So I mentioned we started out with five people, and we're 28 now. Um, Vets.gov is a big reason why. We won this contract a few months ago. Um, when we turned two, that was kind of a threshold for the age of our company, we could start now bidding and, and winning uh, contracts. The work we did with healthcare.gov has been as a subcontractor. We just couldn't, as a new company, win the contract um, or even bid on it. So uh, Vets.gov is our first primary award. It's a veterans-focused portal for all the possible services that a veteran or somebody assisting them could want to apply for, receive, a query about. There's hundreds of different sites and services that exist, and we're going to integrate them all together into a single common design framework that will have been uh, researched with 
veterans from a user experience point of view. And uh, we actually built a beta version of this site last year as kind of a proof of concept of how the VA could work with a company like ours to develop software quickly, get something out the door, iterate on it, and, uh, and, and that act turned into this larger project that we will build out over the next few years. So getting back, uh, I, I, I know I'm at 15 minutes, but I've, I've only got a few more slides, uh, and then I'll answer your questions. USDS, the, the model here is there's a central HQ at the White House. There's federated teams across the cabinet level agencies, and they all work in harmony to uh, help um, mainly federal CIOs and CTOs think of uh, uh, and, and course correct technology projects. So you can really think of them as like business processing, con business process consulting. They intervene, they provide oversight, they set standards, um, try to align with what is, you know, we think is best practice in the industry. Um, and they do some delivery as well, so the Department of Education released something called the, the College Scorecard not too long ago that the USDS team built. Excuse me. Um, but another big thing that they're doing is procurement reform. So they are looking at how we can take existing regulations with regard to procurement, uh, mainly the FAR, which is the Federal Acquisition Registry, I'm probably screwing that up, uh, and provide guidance about how companies can um, work within those regulations and how alternately government agencies can think of uh, how to structure contracts so that that still fits the FAR but opens it up to as many um, companies as possible. Uh, they're also looking at targeted legislative changes um, for the things that can't just be different interpretations of regulations. And uh, the, the problem is, is that the barrier to entry for small companies is still way too high. We're sort of, you know, have the virtue of our notoriety with having worked on healthcare.gov that really helped a lot for us to get started, but for new companies, there's, um, there's still too much compliance and hoop jumping to um, get their foot in the door. And one way that uh, uh, ATNF, which is the, the sort of sister agency to the USDS, is trying to help that is something called the Agile BPA. This is, um, <coughs> basically a, a vehicle by which if you're a company or a small company and you want to compete for government contracts, you can take a coding challenge and if you pass muster, if, like basically you, you, know, you know what you're doing from a technology point of view, you didn't use hundreds of people to do it, you, you developed it quickly, it works, it's fast, uh, those sort of standards, um, you'll get pre-vetted for certain contracts down the road so you can do work um, without having to go through a lot of uh, uh, compliance up front. Um, it's supposed to be f more friendly to small businesses. They've had some bumps getting it out the door, but um, the fact that they're experimenting with this and trying things and, and learning, I think, is really encouraging. Um, so just some final thoughts. Uh, really simple solutions above all. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, what we saw on healthcare.gov was an incredibly complicated, incredibly brittle and complex, needlessly so, uh, architecture for a website, and that was the source of almost all of its problems. Um, simplicity is the full life cycle in my mind from picking tools and, and languages to uh, what your deployment looks like, what it looks like in operation, in maintenance, in support, all those modes. You have to think about the fact that when there are failures, you enter different failure modes at each point. The more complex, the more clever, the more you outsmarted yourself at some point in the past, that's gonna catch up with you in the future. It's gonna make it harder to adapt, harder to fix, harder to change, harder to understand. Um, I like to say what we do is provide competence as a service. Um, most of what we do is, you can see that tech stack is not you know, cutting edge research. It's tried and true best practices from our industry. And, uh, I, I just want to be good, stable, reliable, dependable technology vendor for the government because a lot of these uh, services and challenges can be addressed with 2010 era web tech. So let's just build that and give it to them and we'll win. Uh, build the right thing. So um, this is, if, if healthcare.gov, it was on one hand complex, it was also the wrong solution for the problem. They built essentially enterprise software for what was a retail-like consumer-facing uh, website. And so the root of the, the original sin for that was conceiving of it the wrong way. All of the decisions that flowed down from that led to 
the disaster on launch. So um, having people in the room, tech, good smart technologists, sitting with policy analysts who come up with the right solution in the first place is really critical. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is um, we try to have empathy first for, you know, there, I mentioned the challenges. These are hardworking government servants. They're public servants. They're trying to do the right thing. It's easy to get frustrated with them um, because they're not moving at the pace you want them to or they're not changing as quickly. But uh, we try to have empathy for everyone because everyone's trying to solve the same problem, which is how do we get governments, digital government services to the most people um, most effectively. And, uh, and ultimately for the, for, the, for the consumer, for the client that, that uses the service. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. I'm happy to um, answer any questions you have. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm Ivan Hamburg. I was the CIO of our Health Information Exchange, among other things. What, um, what I'd like to hear more about is the um, procurement, because the traditional RFP is a waterfall. Yeah. And so does that mean that if someone comes out with a traditional RFP that you can't do the BPA, or can you make a BPA kind of angle at a traditional RFP, or do you have, does the organization have to figure out that they want to go in that route first? There's kind of an uneven development thing that's happening, or chicken egg problem happening here, which is we're at the very front edge, edge of reform, but the things that are coming out of the pipeline are still the traditional RFPs. And so request for proposals, if you don't know, is the canonical way that the government uh, asks for work to be done, and these things turn into contracts and you bid on them. Um, the problem with RFP, the traditional RFP process, is that it's kind of a fait accompli. At the point at which you start bidding on it, a whole bunch of decisions have been made by contracting officers and policy analysts. And it's very, very, very hard to just like creatively interpret what they've put out. It's basically you have to, and, and the, the, the penalty for not doing it to the what they say in the RFP is that you could be held in noncompliance, you could not win future awards, there's all sorts of uh, possible. And, and then furthermore, you could just be, again, building the wrong thing. If, if uh, somebody in, you know, a, a government agency who is a well-meaning policy person but has no technology background, they spec out soup to nuts uh, technology solution for a problem they have, um, what, that's not what we want to see in our, in our RFPs. So to answer your question, we're sort of meeting people where they are. We're, we are, for the Vetsec.gov contract, it was kind of a traditional RFP contract vehicle. But I think the right way to do things, uh, I mean, the, we had the virtue of having built the beta, the initial version at site, so it couldn't go too far afield. Uh, but the right way to do things going forward is to get back further in time. And what you really want to do is work, build trust with government agencies, and come up, originate solutions in the room with them before it even gets to, like, at the RFI process, re request for information. Or if there are even other creative ways to get further back in time so that when they're thinking up solutions, you're in the room and, and it, before the train goes down the tracks, at that point, it's very ch hard to change it. Then aren't the people in the room at an incredible advantage when it comes time to bid that out? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and that's a legitimate concern. I think really smart people at USDS and other places are trying to figure out how do you, how do you use judgment to say these are the right kind of companies and because they'll deliver the right kind of effective value for what we're trying to achieve. Um, how, how do you say, who passes the filter? How do you evaluate that criteria? A lot of times it's contracting officers who are not technologists themselves and they have to have some independent way of saying these companies are good, these companies are agile. Agile, just so everybody knows, is the buzzword in government right now. Everybody wants to be agile. Accenture <laughs> wants to be agile, right? Um, which is fine, like if more companies were more, worked with more agility, things would be better. But. Um, it's a, that's a really hard problem. I don't know what the answer is to that, but um, uh, I think it's, the alternative is the status quo, honestly. So we have to figure that out. Um, you. Did the not, sorry, did the not English versions of healthcare.gov have any uh, technical challenges that were different from the issues faced by healthcare.gov? I don't know. I, um, <clears throat> so there's a Spanish translation site that is, 
uh, for the most part, the same infrastructure underneath. There was a layer on top. They actually deployed it into separate, uh, they actually used separate hardware um, for the Spanish site, the same code, different hardware, and then uh, the, the difference was the translation pieces at, at the very front end. So yeah, there, I remember there being some challenges with that early on, but I think they got all ironed out. I don't know if you're thinking of a particular problem, um, but I, uh, I, so again, I haven't worked on the core tra transactional part of the site. I've been working on window shopping and now the, the plan shopping. So um, we're, we integrate with the translated part of healthcare.gov, but does that answer your question? Yeah, like different hardware, different servers, or? Yeah, I think the thinking there was like, there's gonna be more traffic to the English language site than the Spanish language site, so let's allocate more resources over here, and then this is part of the problem, which was um, they, so the legacy healthcare gov site is deployed not into AWS, but into a private data center, um, so, uh, they had a lot of logistical challenges just deploying the application. It was an incredibly fraught, risky activity. And so it was very easy for things to get out of sync. So you could, you could easily have the wrong version of code on the Spanish site. I'm not saying that's what happened, but it, it was easy to get out of sync, so that could have very well have happened. Yeah, did you observe or did you purposely try to induce like some sort of agile uh, mindset in previous like, status quo developers? So did the government itself start changing, I guess, instead of... You mean during the rescue, or... Yeah, like, so why were you during the rescue, or in the months you were working in the winter shop? Like, did they get better at their jobs, or was it still... <laughs> um, during the rescue, we, again, it was, uh, it was a different mindset, it was a different mode. We were trying to, it wasn't really about software development and the agile process, it was more about we are in crisis, we need to triage the critical problems that we have and fix them, um, so operations mainly. Uh, when they saw the way that we worked and how quickly we could work, break down problems, triage them, um, uh, and just because of our experience having worked on high traffic sites, zero in on technical problems, uh, yeah, that rallied a lot of people to the cause, and I think uh, there, there was a lot of like, after the fact, looking back and trying to codify what we did. Um, in fact, the USDS created something called the Playbook, which is sort of the high-level view of what we did on the rescue, like the exact tactics that we took. Um, as far as, you know, prospectively looking forward in, in software development, um, yeah, we're getting there. Like, th th there were groups of people at an agency, I won't name, that went and did a scrum training, and that was great. Like. They probably had the zeal of the converted coming back and wasn't necessarily like the most helpful thing, but it's better than the status quo. So, you know, I, I think the virus is kind of in the system and starting to work its way through. Like, government agencies recognize that it's the status quo is broken and they, they don't know how to get from here to there and we're trying to show them and at the same time we're trying to show them it rubs up against the way their whole bureaucracy is structured. So that's just the real problem. You right here. Yeah, you. Okay, uh, can you talk about uh, structuring uh, iterations based on user feedback into sort of the rigidity sometimes of government contracts? And I don't know if you could talk about at all uh, any experience you have when we're thinking about state contracts and not just federal. We don't have any experience with states yet. Um, I would say, you know, everything we've been talking about has been, you know, kind of federal focused. That's where a lot of the energy is right now. Obviously, Code for America is looking at city government, municipal government, it's great. There's, there's a huge opportunity for state government. Um, in many ways, it's probably the scale is comparable to the federal government because if you think 50 states, you know, they all have departments of health, they all have all these agencies themselves, their own budgets, a lot of those are matched with federal dollars. They all have technology needs, and they're, I mean, if they're not in the spotlight, if, you know, federal government projects, healthcare gov just happened to be in the spotlight because it was the president's signature domestic policy achievement, but there's all kinds of other failed federal IT projects that just go completely under the radar. States are even way, I mean, it's, uh, so I would look at Medicaid, if I was an enterprising young person, I would look at Medicaid, state Medicaid agencies, because that is a federal match, a um, lot of dollars, and they're starting to think about how do we go from 
paying for hundreds of millions of dollars in big monolithic old school IT projects from the big vendors to more modular, smaller. They're changing the percentage of that match a little bit so that the incentives are for you know SaaS model uh, services. So um, I would definitely look at, at states. I know we have a, a lot more questions, but I think you said well, one, more. one more. Okay, um, so hands again. You. Can you share your insight on pricing? Um, I know that you've got a few RFPs under your belt. Pricing uh, your type of firm versus legacy type companies, and what have you found difference? Uh, so we're trying to bring people who would ordinarily be working at startups or um, private sector to work on government projects. So we need to be competitive with what the private sector is charging for salaries. Um, that so. Uh, that kind of is the root of the tree. All the other decisions flow down from there in terms of how we structure. So it also helps us think about resourcing how many people we think we're going to need to do X, Y, Z project. Um, and you know, right now there's a shift happening between, I mean, usually these big RFPs are, okay, here's a big pool of money. And then here's a big set of things that you should accomplish by the end of this contract. And you can draw down on that pool of money. And so a lot of companies will just plus up their staff, right, so that they can draw down more of that pool, whether they you know, could have more efficiently used it or not. And there's the begin, some agencies are trying to do a more project-based, fixed, firm fixed uh, pricing, um, which we're more interested in, honestly. Um, because that's more concrete, more uh, it has you know more boundaries around it in terms of time and effort, um, and it's more predictable in terms of what we can pay people. So, um, really, our model is like, yeah, we might be paying people who work at ad hoc more um, than their comparable engineer at a traditional IT contractor, but they have 10x as many people working on the project, right? So. Okay, thanks everyone. I'll stick around. <laughs>